Hello, my name is Ospen Lutte. I am a Norwegian 3D generalist, um, visual artist, I guess. And uh, I like to use Blender to make videos. And for the past two years, I've been posting videos on YouTube where I've been making tutorials, step-by-step -step guides, and just how to make stuff in Blender. But we're not going to be talking about my YouTube channel today. We're going to be talking about something that I care about and I think about every single day. And it's photorealism. The process of taking something virtual on your computer and turning it into a scene that feels real and has some authentic feeling to it. So we're going to start out by looking at this scene. Here we have a car. It's just going to be added more and more details until we have an environment that looks um, that it could be realistic in every single angle. So uh, we add some grass. We add turn on the cycles render and in, which looks amazing. And then we add more trees. This is from uh, Botanic, and the car is from Traffic. And then there's another blender add-on called Real City. So these are all assets that are available to find online. But what we want to do is that we want to turn this into a scene that looks real in any direction. So now I'm going to play a video, and it's probably going to need some uh, <laughs> need some help because I messed up the embedding of the video. There we go. So as you can see, we're using the Nishita sky texture to get this beautiful hard sunlight in cycles. We add in a car. We make sure that every direction that you watch, it's going to be photorealistic backdrop. So we're making this environment. And the reason why we're doing this is we want to add a camera. And if you can add a camera, then we can start making this photorealistic scene. So we want to build this scene up. And we also want to add some backstory to this. So to the ground of this scene, we're adding this road. So here you can see I'm using these curves to just add some roads so the grass will be sort of push down like this. This car has been driving here. So when we see this car here, we can understand what has happened. So now we can place a camera wherever we want. So we want to try and place a camera up here and animate it. But something about this just doesn't look real. You know, I'm not feeling this. So when you're looking at this render now, it can be tempting to ask yourself the question, why doesn't this look real? Let me just go to the next slide here. Yeah, this question, why doesn't this look real? And what I think is the problem with this question, and this question is going to hit you like a truck. It's like a really difficult question to answer, and it's a comprehensive class question. And what I want to do is that I want to present to you today some questions that are easier to ask. So instead of why doesn't this look real, which I think is the wrong question, I have prepared some questions that I think are a lot easier to ask. And um, that is what this presentation is all about. So I want you to treat the virtual scene like a real life recording situation. So we're going to ask ourselves a question based on the real life. And um, yeah, so the first question is, who is recording this? The second question is, why were they filming? So let's break this down. Who is recording this? By asking yourself this question, you will learn more about the technical context of your scene. So for example, who is the camera operator? What camera are they using? What's the experience of the cinematographer? Have they done it before? What is happening here, quite technically? And then it will also give you more about the ca camera equipment quality. If it's an expensive camera, what's the dynamic range? Do you have any chromatic aberration here? What's going on technically with the camera? And the qu second question is, why were they filming? And this question will reveal intention about your scene. For example, has it happened before? Is it something that's been rehearsed? Is it a documentary? Is it an, an event that is quite unusual? And by asking these questions and really stepping outside the box, you can learn um, quite existential question, what is the reason for this video to exist? And if you can truly understand this, then I think that's a step in the right direction if you want to achieve through photorealism. So let's try this. Let's use our clip, and let's try and ask ourselves this question. But now you might be thinking, this is a little bit difficult, because this is just a camera in Blender. No one really, there's no cinematographer here. This is just hypothetical, and it's just a virtual scene. So to make this question give a little bit more sense, let's try and practice by asking them on a real scene instead. So I'm going to pull up another video. This is from the Shiboya Crossing in Japan, in Tokyo. And we're going to try and extract as much data as we can from this video file. So I might, help, I might need some help playing this video. Yeah, sorry. I, I embedded the videos in the wrong format, I think. So they have to do this manually. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, so here you can see we have the video of Shiboya Crossing. Let's ask ourselves these questions. Who is recording this? OK, I'm thinking it's maybe an amateur, because it's a little bit shaky. 
And uh, the dynamic range isn't really good, or at least it seems to be a little bit overexposed. And the lens isn't the sharpest in the world, and it's, uh, it seems to be on a 70 millimeter shot. OK, why were they filming? It's a pretty uh, interesting event in Shibuya. All these people come rushing into the street. I'm thinking that what we just saw is a clip where someone is just trying to film what's happened. It, it's a tourist that got excited about an unusual situation. So uh, some, mm, some of the details that we see, some noticeable camera details, which is the next slide. Yeah, we got a soft lens, and we got some overexposed areas. Not necessarily overexposed, but the dynamic range of the camera isn't high enough to be able to see the details in the um, car paint, for example. Some, and we also got some shaky footage, no tripod or stabilization, and I'm guessing it's a medium budget digital camera. So what we have here is that we have a video recording of an unusual event that a tourist got excited about. And if you're a little bit confused as to why we're doing this, why are we asking these rudimentary questions, these fundamental questions about these video clips, is that I think this is a, it's a great process. So if it doesn't make sense right now, let's just trust the process and let's try this one more time. So I have another video clip, which is, <laughs> perhaps I should tell you in advance that it's a video clip, but uh, yeah. So what I can see right away just from the thumbnail here is that this actually has a little bit of lens distortion. So we're probably dealing with a cheap lens. And um, it's quite dark outside, so it's excited to see what's going to be the um, light sensitivity of this sensor. OK, so we can see that. Yeah, this, this camera is quite light sensitive, and we're moving around, we're filming this couch, which I don't think really matters, because as you can see of the camera motion here, it's sort of sliding around, it's floating around a little bit, which kind of feels like it was shot on a gimbal. So I'm guessing that this is some sort of hobby filmmaker trying out this new gimbal, and it's actually, it's a little bit unstable still, so it's probably an improperly balanced gimbal shot with a DSLR. Oh, and the, the bokeh in the distance there is also a little bit uneven, and uh, yeah, we can actually see the camera operator in the reflection there. So if we look at what we got now, we got uh, uh, on the next slide, yeah, we got some severe lens distortion, which tells us that this is a cheap lens, and we got some ugly bokeh, not necessarily ugly, but definitely asymmetrical and not round that you would expect to see in more premium cine lenses, and we also got our gimbal. We can see that there's a gimbal being used there. So we know that it's an, we can assume that it's improperly balanced gimbal. It is a camera with strong low light performance, probably the A7S Mark II. And what we have is that the video is a recording of an inexperienced cinematographer testing a gimbal camera stabilizer. So why are we doing this? Why are we trying to look at these video clips and ask ourselves these rudimentary fundamental questions? This is what I think is the beautiful part of this process. So let's just, let's just have a look at what we did. So what we have done is we've taken a real video, and we've asked ourselves the questions, who is recording this, why were they filming? We try to extract this information, and we are trying to learn more about the recording situation. We don't know what happened, but we're going to have to try to assume and try to come up with a reason why could this happen. And what we have is we have some sort of idea of what the recording context could be. And this next part is the entire reason why I'm standing here, is the whole point of my presentation. I want you to take this process that we just did, and I want you to reverse it. I want you to start out with the recording situation. I want you to imagine somehow someone brought a real camera to a real place, and they started recording this. And I want you to try and fill the gaps and add the context who might be recording this situation, and what could possibly be a reason to bring a camera to this place. And then I want you to apply all those thoughts into your 3D scene. And that will just change your mindset completely, because now you have to deal with the consequence of having one of these guys in your scene. This is the camera operator, cinematographer, person holding the camera, and they, are, they bring so much to your scene. They, every time a person picks up a camera, something magical happens. They have an intention, they have hopes and dreams, stuff they're afraid of, they have stuff they want to do, stuff they don't want to do, stuff they're being told to do but don't want to do anyways, and stuff they're being paid to do, and stuff they're being not paid enough to do. So we want to try and recreate this. Let's go back to our first scene, and let's try and add a real-life cinematographer or camera operator or just a person with a phone to our scene, and let's see how we're able to capture this scene in a perhaps more photorealistic way than the first render that we started out with. But we have to 
ask yourself this, cam uh, this question first. Why would you film a camera? No, why would you film a car? <laughs> What could possibly be a reason to film a car? And we have to take this question very seriously, because if you're, if you're not able to use proper logic, then everything falls apart. So what could possibly be a reason for someone to film a car? OK, so let's try and use our brain and try and actually think logically about this. I have prepared three examples for just what could possibly be a reason. First example, it's an ad for the car. OK, if it's an ad for the car that we have placed in our scene, I'm thinking that someone is paying money to show that car in a really nice way. So you want to you show the car in a beautiful way, which probably means that you don't want heavily distorted lens. You don't want um, a soft lens. You don't want ugly bokeh. You want a camera that is expensive. So we have our expensive camera. And you don't want a cinematographer or a camera operator that's just waving this around with no attention. You want and experienced cinematographers. We just have to extend our logic from the beginning of the uh, start where we have, it's an ad for the car. So we have to apply the logic in every step of the way. So now what we're going to try and make is we're going to try and make a video that exists because someone got paid to make the car look as good as possible. So the first thing we do, we go to Google and we search for expensive camera. We get the Aria Alexa LF, for example. It has a beautiful large sensor. It's going to produce some nice shallow depth of field. And it has a really high dynamic range. So we will see all the details in the highlights or not all, but enough, you know? And then we have this beautiful lens. And now we don't want this camera to be shaking around on an unstable gimbal. We want it to be really heavy, and we want it to move slowly. So we're adding one of these bad boys, this heavy, goes on the rails, and it's just, it's almost difficult to mess this up, you know? So, yeah, and I'm gonna play another video, which is, uh, yeah, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take this concept of our heavy, expensive camera, and we're gonna add it to Blender. So that means that we're going to just take our uh, camera just and add a few keyframes, just keep it going really slowly. Uh, so let's have a look. Yeah, so there you can see the camera is just crawling super slowly. I'm not sure if you can even see that. It's crawling super slowly toward the car. And if you were a cinematographer, you would think a lot about where you're placing the camera here. So we're placing the camera far away. So when you're rendering this, you get this beautiful shallow depth of field. And the, the camera is sort of creeping towards the car. And you're, you're revealing that the car is in a forest, for example, by going side to side. So let's have a look at what we just did. We have added a, um, the camera allows us to have, um, we, we have a, a telephoto lens. So we're separating our, our um, object a little bit from the background by we're getting this beautiful depth of field and also since we have to go in the mindset of what would a professional cinematographer do, they would probably not want to reveal that this is a production. So in the reflection of the car, you can't really see the camera crew. And that's deliberate, because that's the stuff that you have to think about. So you're, that's why you often maybe see a car filmed from a little bit um, diagonally. You know, That can sometimes happen, at least. Unless you have a higher budget, then you can just remove it in post, I guess. OK, so we have to come up with another reason to film a car in a forest. How about someone got a new drone? OK, so we got a lightweight camera. We want to attach the camera to the drone. And now this camera is going to be significantly cheaper. So we can have lower dynamic range. We can have, uh, for example, a lot of barrel distortion, lens distortion. And we can have um, chromatic aberration. We can even add some more sharpening. And we can add a lot of noise. So and that, since it's a new drone, we're probably going to have an inexperienced camera operator. So what we're going to have to create now is that we're going to make a video that exists because someone bet their friend they could fly through their car without crashing. So let's see if that works. Yeah, so we're going to start off by importing the drone to our scene because that's really nice just to get some reference. So you can actually see the size and the scale of the drone and get a feel of what it would actually look like moving around this car. So once you have the drone in your scene, you can, for example, add the camera to the drone and give it a similar field of view. So now when you animate it, the camera is following the drone, and you have to give the drone some weight. And if you've tried to fly a drone without any stabilizers before, you can know that it actually moves a little bit like a robot. And we can lower the car windows, and the drone will actually fly, fly through. So now this is the part we can go completely crazy by adding a lot of lens distortion, a lot of sharpening, and just blowing out the skies completely and having a lot of noise in the shadows. And if you've tried to fly a drone before, you know that once you start messing around with this axis, where you're going side to side, as we'll see in a second, yeah, it's really difficult to 
keep it going, and you probably end up <laughs> crashing the car. <laughs> okay, so let's just quickly review what we did. We added some severe lens distortion to our scene, so we get this barrel distortion effect, because this looks a little bit like a barrel, I guess. And then we have a lot of um, clipped highlights, because it's just way too bright for our tiny little cheap sensor. And then there's also going to be a lot of noise in the shadows. So we're going to have a lot of, you didn't really see this in the video because the video compression was so harsh, but that's just fine. Just feel free to add a bunch of noise in the shadows, and then the video compression will treat the video just as it would with a similar photorealistic video, with an actual video clip. And also, if you notice, since we had our drone in the, an actually physical 3D model of the drone, or not physical, virtual 3D model, you can actually see it in the reflection of the car which opens the door for some mind games. Is it, why would you include the reflection of the drone in the car? And uh, we might even explore this thought even further. Okay, so the final reason, or not the final, but one more reason to film a car in forest. What if it's someone got a new car and I wanna show it off to everyone? Okay, so what if, I'm thinking that immediately, if you wanna show off your car, you don't have time to just go and grab a nice camera. So maybe you just pick up your phone and if you wanna show it off right away, you might even be live streaming it. So that means that we're going to get some seriously distracted camera work because you're focusing a little bit on the live stream and you're focusing on trying to just show off your new car. So we are going to get a video that exists because an influencer got a new car and want to show it off to her fans. Okay, so I think this is, yeah, this is going to play a video. So we're going to use our phone and that means that we're going to get a vertical video. And what we can do in Blender, which is really nice, is that you can just always parent stuff to stuff, which is probably the most powerful way to, for me at least, uh, make stuff uh, make sense in a way. So here, for example, you can parent the camera to uh, an actual human being. So here you can see you have the phone levitating, which is impossible, so we're gonna need an actual person holding the phone. So we're importing just this Mixamo model, and now when you're using an IK constraint, you can rotate the phone around, and it will feel a little bit like there's actual someone moving this. So let's add some animation, and let's just not care about the legs sliding around. <laughs> and now you can see that they're checking out this car. So now let's just add this uh, live stream filter on top of this, and you got this situation where someone is trying to film their car. And then the big brain move is to actually keep this camera operator visible in the reflection. So now you can see that we will be able to see this person holding. <laughs> yeah. So that's peak photorealism, or at least uh, some uh, mind games we're playing with our audience. <laughs> okay, so to summarize, keep asking yourself logical questions about the world you want to make real. So for example, we're gonna try and start with the easy questions and then we're gonna just zoom out until we get quite existential. So we're gonna start off with the simple question, who is recording? Are they experienced with cameras? And then we just take a step back and we, we look at the entire recording situation. What camera did they use? What lens? Is it a full frame sensor? And then we keep going. What, it, what's actually happening in this video? Is this real? Is it rehearsed? Has it happened before? Hang on, who cared enough about this to record this? Why were they filming? And then finally, you get to the question that you really want to try and answer. Why does this video exist? And if you can answer this question, your way to photorealism is going to be a lot easier than if you just try and focus on textures and surface imperfections all day, which is what I hear a lot of people talking about when they talk about photorealism. So um, yeah, what I really like about having this, um, uh, yeah, it's another video, sorry, but it's the last one, so. <laughs> yeah, so my favorite part about Blender is that you can add whatever camera you like, you can just do some Googling, find out the spec sheet of the camera, what's the sensor size, what's the lens characteristics, and stuff like that, and it's, it's free to add whatever camera you want. So. It's, it's such a liberating feeling to just pick a scene, set up a realistic scene in your, uh, in your, in, in your project file, and then you can just discover how you want to show this off to the audience. How, do you, how would a camera operator affect the scene that you have? And uh, yeah, that's pretty much my uh, message today. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.